debate. IntelligenceSquared.com Believe it or not, and I know most people do not, violence has been in decline for long stretches of time, and we may be living in the most peaceful era in our species' existence. The decline of violence has not been steady, it has not brought violence down to zero, and it is not guaranteed to continue. But I hope to persuade you that it's a persistent historical development, visible on scales from millennia to years, from wars and genocides to the treatment of children and animals. I'm going to walk you through six historical declines of violence, try to identify their immediate causes, that is, particular historical events of the era, and then try to tie them together in terms of their ultimate causes, that is, general historical forces interacting with human nature. The first historical decline of violence I call the pacification process. Until around 5,000 years ago, humans everywhere lived in anarchy without central government. What was life like in this state of nature? This is a question that thinkers have speculated on for hundreds of years. Thomas Hobbes famously wrote that the, in a state of nature, the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. A century later, Jean-Jacques Rousseau countered that nothing can be more gentle than him in his primitive state. Now, these two gentlemen were talking through their hats. Neither of them had any idea what life was like in a state of nature. But today, we can do better, <clears throat> because there are two ways of estimating rates of violence in non-state societies. The first is forensic archaeology. I think of this as CSI Paleolithic. Uh, namely, what proportion of prehistoric skeletons have signs of violent trauma, such as bashed-in skulls, decapitations, arrowheads embedded in bones, or mummies found with ropes around their necks. Uh, here we have 21 uh, estimates, and they span quite a range, but their average is 15%. That is 15% of uh, people in non-states, uh, in, in uh, archaeological sites, uh, appear to have met their end through violence. We can compare that figure to those from some modern states. Uh, here we have the battle deaths from the United States and Europe in the 20th century at about uh, six-tenths of a percent. Here we have the entire world in the 20th century throwing in all of the deaths from genocide, the indirect deaths from starvation and disease, uh, and the deaths from man-made famines, and that comes up to about 3%. And here we have the world in the year 2005. The bar is less than a pixel high and hence uh, invisible because it is at three one-hundredths of 1%. The second way of estimating uh, violence in non-state societies is through ethnographic vital statistics. The various waves of government that spread out of the first cradles of civilization left a few pockets of the earth still in a state of anarchy, namely uh, tribal societies of hunter-gatherers and hunter-horticulturalists, and ethnographers who lived with them over a protracted period of time can calculate the various causes of death. Here we have 27 estimates, and again, they span quite a range, but they average 524 per 100,000 per year. That is about one half of 1% of the population dies from uh, warfare every year. Again, let's compare that figure to those from modern states, and I'll stack the deck against modernity by picking some of the most violent states in their most violent periods, such as Germany in the 20th century, two world wars, uh, uh, comes in at 160 per 100,000 per year. Russia in the 20th century, two world wars and a civil war at 140. Japan, a world war that ended with not one but two nuclear strikes at about uh, 40. United States in the 20th century, two world wars and half a dozen other foreign wars at less than four. The world in the 20th century, again, a uh, maximal estimate that includes the deaths from genocides and man-made famines is about 60. And the world in the year 2005, the battle death rate is about uh, three-tenths of uh, a, a violent death per 100,000 per year. 
So not to put too fine a point on it, but when it comes to life in a state of nature, Hobbes was right, Rousseau was wrong. The immediate cause was the rise and expansion of states leading to the various paxes, the states of peace imposed by uh, the kingdoms and empires, such as the Pax Romana, Pax Islamica, Pax Hispanica, and so on. The uh, expansion of empires drove down rates of violence, not because the early kings and emperors had a benevolent interest in the welfare of their citizens, but rather because tribal raiding and feuding is a nuisance to overlords, who'd rather keep the people alive to supply them with soldiers and slaves and uh, taxes. Just as a farmer has an interest in preventing his livestock from killing each other, so a early king or emperor would rather uh, that the, his people not waste resources in settling scores among them or shuffling resources around, uh, but he would rather have a claim on them himself. The second historical decline of violence can be illustrated by this woodcut showing a day in the life of the Middle Ages. <laughs> and the process that changed it has been called the civilizing process. Homicide records go back in many parts of Europe for centuries, and historical criminologists such as Manuel Eisner have plotted them over time. Here we have a plot that runs from the year 1200 to the year 2000, and I've plotted the homicide rate here on a logarithmic scale from a tenth of a homicide per 100,000 per year to 1 to 10 to 100. And as you can see in the graph, there's been a massive decline in the homicide rate. Uh, so that a contemporary Englishman has 1 35th the chance of being killed as his medieval ancestor. This is true not just in England, but in every part of Europe for which statistics have been uh, gathered. Here we have Italy, the Netherlands, Germany and Switzerland, and Scandinavia. Here is the average of those five regions, and for the comparison's sake, I've plotted the 524 per 100 thousand per year figure from the non-state societies, this gap here is more or less what I've been calling the pacification process, this further decline, the uh, civilizing process. I took the title from a classic book by the German sociologist Norbert Elias, who argued that in the transition from the Middle Ages to modernity, there was a consolidation of central states and kingdoms from the patchwork of, uh, of um, baronies and principalities and duchies that had uh, previously polka dotted the continent. With it, criminal justice was nationalized, and the constant uh, feuding among warlords, otherwise known as knights, gave way to the king's justice. Also during this transition, there was a growing infrastructure of commerce, financial instruments and, and uh, currencies that were recognized within the borders of these newly consolidated kingdoms, and technologies of transportation and timekeeping that lubricated trade so that increasingly zero-sum plunder gave way to positive-sum trade, a point that I will return to. Uh, oops, what, I'm missing a slide here. I thought I'd fix this. I'm just going to, uh, there's a slide here that I don't want you to miss, so I'm just gonna pull it up from another presentation. My apologies for the uh, delay, but. The um, third transition can be illustrated by considering some of the ways that the early uh, authorities kept peace within their kingdoms. Punishments such as breaking on the wheel, burning at the stake, clawing, sawing in half, and impalement. But in a process that's been called the humanitarian revolution, these four barbaric practices were abolished in a fairly narrow slice of time. Uh, here we have a timeline of the a uh, number of major countries with judicial torture, and there was a wave of abolitions concentrated in the second half of the 18th century, including uh, the famous prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment in the Eighth Amendment to the uh, American Constitution, although England clearly got there first. Uh, also uh, abolished during this time was the profligate use of the death penalty for non-lethal crimes. In 18th century England, there were 222 capital offenses on the books, including poaching, counterfeiting, robbing a rabbit warren, being in the company of gypsies, <laughs> and strong evidence of malice in a child seven to 14 years of age. 
these weren't just on the law books, but they were exuberantly applied. For example, Samuel Johnson wrote of a seven-year-old girl who was hanged for stealing a petticoat. But by 1864, the number of capital crimes had been reduced to four. I'm going to switch back to the original presentation now that I got that good stuff out. Uh, also, uh, more recently, the death penalty itself uh, has uh, been on death row. Uh, this timeline shows the number of European countries that have capital punishment in their law books. There was a wave of abolitions more recently in the last 75 years, but the blue line, which shows the number of European countries that actually carry out executions, show that well before uh, European countries struck capital punishment from their law books, they had lost their taste for applying it. And the uh, downward trend for countries that actually executed criminals started uh, well before the legal abolitions. Also abolished during this time were witch hunts, religious persecution, dueling, blood sports, debtors' prisons, and perhaps most famously, slavery. Slavery used to be legal everywhere in the world. All the ancient civilizations practiced it. No one seemed to find anything wrong with it. Then, starting in the 18th century, a uh, wave of abolitions uh, was initiated that culminated in 1980 with the abolition of slavery in Mauritania, uh, which marked a, a transition such that for the first time in history, slavery was illegal everywhere uh, on Earth after thousands of years in which it had been legal everywhere on Earth. What were the immediate causes of the humanitarian revolution? Well, a plausible uh, prior event was the rise of printing and literacy. Uh, this graph from 1500 to 1850 shows that in the uh, 18th, uh, sorry, the 17th century, there was an almost 25-fold increase in the efficiency of uh, manufacturing books. That efficiency was put into practice, so there was an exponential growth in the number of books published in the 18th century, kind of an early version of Moore's Law. And there were more people around who could read them. It was during the 18th century that for the first time a majority of Englishmen were literate. Why should literacy matter? Well, another name for this era is the Enlightenment, because knowledge replaced superstition and ignorance. And if you have propagation of ideas, the driving of bad ideas out by good ideas, and people are disabused of notions such as that Jews poison wells, heretics go to hell, witches cause crop failures, children are possessed by the devil, Africans are brutish, and so on, it's bound to undermine many rationales for violence. As Voltaire said during this period, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Also, printing is a technology of cosmopolitanism, a, a, a way that people can be raised out of their parochial vantage point and be exposed to new ideas and new people. And it's plausible that the habit of reading fiction, history, and journalism can encourage people to inhabit other people's minds, leading to an expansion of empathy and a decline in cruelty. If you're in the habit of imagining what life is like from the point of view of other people, perhaps you take less, less pleasure in watching them be sawn in half. The fourth major historical decline of violence has been called the long peace, and it speaks to the commonly made assertion that the 20th century was the most violent in history. Now, it undoubtedly is, is true that World War II was the deadliest event in human history in terms of the absolute number of people that were killed, but there were an awful lot more people around in the 20th century, and it's not so clear that it was the worst event in history in terms of the percentage of the population that was killed. In this graph, I'm going to show you the 100 worst things that people have ever done to one another, uh, taken from a list by a man who calls himself an atrocitologist, uh, <laughs> Matthew White, who has a, a book coming out soon. I've scaled them by the population of the world at the time and plotted them on a graph that runs from 500 BCE to 2000 CE. And the graph shows us that as a proportion of the population, World War II only comes in at ninth place and World War I isn't even in the top 10. And for that matter, history's worst atrocities are pretty evenly sprinkled over 2,500 years of human history. Now, there, uh, you will 
undoubtedly noticed that the data cloud funnels downward for the last 500 years. Presumably, this is not because in ancient times they only committed really big atrocities, and more recently we've committed big, medium, and small ones. But rather, it's a reflection of the historical record. The closer you get to the present, the more complete the records are. So let's zoom in on the last 500 years, a period in which Jack Levy has plotted trends in great power war. These are the wars that involve the 800-pound uh, guerrillas of the day, the countries that can project military force beyond their own borders. Uh, and the, all of these graphs stretch from 1500 to the present. Uh, this graph shows the proportion of years that the great powers fought each other, and it shows that several centuries ago, the great powers were pretty much always at war with each other. This, this is 100% of the time. More recently, uh, they've rarely been at war with each other. This is a graph showing the frequency of wars involving a great power, how many new wars were begun per 25-year uh, period. That also shows a decline. Here we have the duration of wars involving a great power, yet another decline. Past centuries had uh, events such as the Thirty Years' War, the Eighty Years' War, the Hundred Years' War. Uh, the 20th century had the Six-Day War. But there's one trend that goes in the opposite direction, and that is the deadliness of wars involving a great power. Namely, once they did begin a war, how many people were they able to kill per country per year? And that shows a substantial increase until 1950, where the curve does a U-turn. And over the last 60 years, we've been living through a period in which the Frequency of war has gone down, the duration of war has gone down, and uniquely in history, in recent history, the deadliness of war has gone down as well. If you combine uh, all three of these statistics to yield a total, a death toll for, uh, uh, for great power wars, you get a zigzag line that terminates in the lowest rate of death in warfare in 500 years of great power history. We can zoom in on the uh, last hundred years, for which the data are still more detailed, and I'm going to show a graph that I adapted from uh, someone who's in the audience, the peace researcher Nil Nils Petter uh, Gledich, and this breaks down, this shows the death toll from all war wars worldwide over the course of the 20th century, and there are two unmistakable bloodbaths around the time of the two world wars, but they did not augur an increasing trend or even a new normal, but rather something closer to a last gasp. And over the last 66 years, you see the line hugging the floor, showing an unusually low rate of death in warfare. This has been called the long peace, the fact that since 1946, there's been a historically unprecedented decline in interstate war. Uh, the United States and Soviet Union fought zero wars between them, contrary to all expert predictions that a third world war was inevitable. No nuclear weapon has been used since Nagasaki, again contradicting a widespread consensus that the Third World War would be a nuclear war. There have been no wars between the great powers since 1953 with the end of the Korean War. No wars between Western European countries, which might, might sound like a banal observation, like who would ever expect today, say, France and Germany to go to war? But needless to say, this is a historically unusual state of affairs. In the 600 years before 1945, Western European countries initiated two new wars a year for 600 years. And there have been uh, no wars between developed countries, the 40 countries with the highest GDP per capita. Well, what about the rest of the world? Uh, in a development that I have called the new peace, the long peace is beginning to spread to the rest of the world. Since 1946, as I've mentioned, there have been fewer interstate wars worldwide, but there have been more civil wars. As newly independent states with inept governments defended themselves against insurgent movements, both sides armed, uh, financed, and egged on by the Cold War superpowers. But since 1991, even the number of civil wars has shown a bumpy decline. The question now is, which wars kill more people? the interstate wars of earlier decades or the civil wars of recent decades? And this graph uh, shows the answer. Here we have the uh, number of battle deaths per conflict per year for interstate wars, that is a government on each side, which has been, as I've mentioned, in, in uh, uh, decline decade by decade. Here we have 
the internationalized civil wars, that is civil wars in which some external power butts in, usually on the side of the government, and the pure internal civil wars. And what it shows is that even the bulge in civil war deaths is nowhere near as big as the death toll from interstate wars of the earlier decades of the post-war period. If you combine now the number of wars with the number of deaths per year of war and sim to uh, simply add up all the uh, deaths from all wars combined, you get a stacked layer graph that looks as follows. Uh, each, the thickness of each wedge corresponds to the rate of death in that category of war. Here we have the, number, the rate of death in colonial wars, a category of war that no longer exists as the European empires gave up their colonies, so that's tapered off to zero. Here we have the rate of death from interstate wars, which shows a jagged and spiky but unmistakably downward trend with three bulges that include the deaths from the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and the Iran-Iraq War. Here we have the pure civil wars and the internationalized civil wars. And uh, as you can see, the bulge of deaths from the civil wars by no means makes up for the decline uh, that the world has enjoyed from the uh, interstate wars in previous period, periods. And in fact, here we are in the la first decade of the 21st century with a, an unprecedentedly thin laminate of war deaths, which suggests that the dream of the 1960s folk singers is uh, starting to come true. The world is almost putting an end to war. What were the immediate causes of the long peace and the new peace? Three of them were thrown out as hypotheses 200 years ago by Immanuel Kant in his essay, Perpetual Peace, in which he argued that democracy, trade, and an international community all changed the incentive structure uh, among nations to make war less appealing. More recently, Bruce Russett and John O'Neill have tested Kant's hypothesis and have found that all three of these variables increased in the second half of the 20th century, and in a large regression analysis showed that holding everything else constant, all are statistical predictors of peace. Here we have the uh, two trend lines, one for the number of democracies, one for the number of autocracies. So now in the world today, there are more democracies than autocracies. Here we have international trade, and it, over the past 120 years or so, and it, it shows that there has been a, a, a huge takeoff of trade since the end of World War II. And here we have membership in intergovernmental organizations, which has increased steadily since the late 19th century, but with an acceleration after World War II. The final decline of violence that I uh, discuss, I call the rights revolutions. The targeting of violence on smaller scales against vulnerable sectors of the population, such as racial minorities, women, children, homosexuals, and animals. The civil rights movement in the United States put an end to the practice of lynching, which in the late 19th century took place at a rate of about 150 a year. By 1950, that had fallen to zero. Hate crime murders of blacks have been monitored by the FBI since the mid-1990s. They were never very plentiful, just about five a year. Uh, even that has dwindled to one. Non-lethal hate crimes against blacks, such as intimidation and assault, have also been in decline since they were first uh, measured. The women's rights movement has seen an 80% decrease in the rate of rape since it was first estimated by the FBI in the early 1970s. A similarly precipitous decline in the rate of domestic violence, uh, and this is true of the UK as well as the US, and a decrease in the most extreme form of domestic violence, namely axoricide, the murder of wives, and mariticide, the murder of husbands. Uh, in fact, in this case, the uh, decline for male victims is even steeper than the decline for female victims, showing that the women's movement has been very, very good for husbands. <laughs> the children's rights movement has seen a decline in American states that allow paddling and other forms of corporal punishment in schools. Every public opinion poll in the West has shown a decline in the approval and use of spanking and, uh, pad and smacking and other forms of corporal punishment. And rates of both physical and sexual abuse have declined uh, in the US since they were first measured in, in 1990. The gay rights movement has seen an increase in the number of states that have decriminalized homosexuality, both nation states across the world and American states, which now stands at 100%. 
and anti-hate crime, anti-gay anti hate crime in intimidations have been in decline since they were first measured. The animal rights movement has seen a decline in hunting, an increase in vegetarianism, both in the UK and the US, and a sharp decline in the number of motion pictures in which animals were harmed. <laughs> well, why has violence declined on so many scales of time and magnitude? One possibility is that human nature has changed and that all violent impulses have somehow been bred out of us. Well, um, I consider this unlikely for a number of reasons, but I'll just mention one of them, and that is the prevalence of homicidal fantasies. Uh, a number of researchers have asked students the question, have you ever fantasized about killing someone you don't like? Say someone who's stolen your boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, or someone who's humiliated you in public. And the results are that 15% of women and a third of men frequently fantasize about <laughs> killing people they don't like. And more than 60% of women and three quarters of men at least occasionally think about killing people they don't like. And the rest of them are lying. A more likely possibility is that human nature is extraordinarily complex and has always embraced both inclinations towards violence and inclinations that counteract them, what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature, and that historical circumstances have increasingly favored our peaceable inclinations. What are the motives for violence? There's raw exploitation, the elimination of a person that happens to be an obstacle in the path of something you want, leading to rape, plunder, conquest, and the elimination of rivals. There's the very different drive toward dominance, the urge to climb the pecking order and become alpha male among individuals, or the corresponding drive among groups for ethnic, racial, national, or religious supremacy. There's moralistic violence in the form of revenge, the idea that, that uh, if someone has committed something, uh, committed a wrong, it is not only permissible but mandatory to uh, direct violence against him, resulting in vendettas, rough justice, and cruel punishments. And then there are ideologies, uh, that, such as those of militant religions, nationalism, Nazism, and communism, that justify vast outlays of violence by a, a utopian cost-benefit analysis. If your belief system holds out the hope of a world that will be infinitely good forever, how much violence are you entitled to uh, perpetrate in pursuit of this infinitely perfect world? Well, as much as you want, and you're always ahead of the game. The benefits always outweigh the costs. Moreover, imagine that there are people who hear about your scheme for a perfect world and just don't don't get with a program. They might oppose you in bringing uh, heaven to earth. How evil are they? They're the only thing standing in the way of an infinitely good world. Well, you do the math. What do we have to counteract these uh, motives for violence? What are the better angels of our nature? Well, there's self-control, the ability to anticipate the consequences of behavior and inhibit violent impulses. There's empathy, the ability to feel others' pain. There's the moral sense, particularly the sense of uh, fairness, that people shouldn't be uh, uh, harmed uh, for no reason. And then there is reason itself, the cognitive processes that allow us to engage in objective, detached analysis. The crucial historical question now is which developments bring out our better angels and stay our hand before they can commit acts of bloodshed? One possibility is that Hobbes got it right when he called for a Leviathan, a state and judicial system with a monopoly on the legitimate use of force, which can eliminate the incentives for exploitative, exploitative attack by punishing aggressors and therefore uh, reducing their incentive for uh, attack. That can make everyone less nervous because not only does the Leviathan deter you, but you know that the Le Leviathan is deterring your rivals which means you no longer are tempted to carry out preemptive strikes and uh, do it to him before he does it to you. You no longer have to maintain a belligerent stance of deterrence, and you no longer have to carry out vengeance, uh, come what may, if you can outsource your vengeance to the uh, state. Some historical evidence comes from the pacifying and civilizing effects of states that I mentioned in, at the beginning of the talk, and the fact that one can watch this movie in reverse when government retreats uh, from a territory, leaving a zone of anarchy, which always end up violent, such as the American Wild West, failed states, collapsed empires, and mafias and street gangs who 
deal in illegal activities in the first place and hence cannot avail themselves of the dispute resolution apparatus of the state. A second possibility has been called gentle commerce. The idea is plunder is a zero-sum game, but trade is a positive-sum game, one in which everybody wins. And as improving technology allows the trade of goods and ideas over longer distances, among larger groups of people, and at lower cost, more and more of the rest of the world become more valuable alive than dead. And uh, this is a point that uh, uh, our other speaker this evening, Matt Ridley, has elaborated in uh, glorious detail in, uh, in his book, The Rational Optimist. Some historical evidence comes from regression analyses showing that holding all else equal, company, countries with open economies and a greater reliance on international trade get embroiled in fewer wars, are riven by fewer civil wars, and host fewer genocides. Then there's the hypothesis of the expanding circle, which was proposed by Charles Darwin, but named by the philosopher Peter Singer, according to which evolution bequeathed us with a sense of empathy. Unfortunately, by default, we apply it only to a very narrow circle of family, close friends, and cute little warm things like babies and small animals. But over the course of history, you can see the circle of empathy expanding to embrace the clan, then the tribe, then the nation, then other races, both sexes, children, and eventually perhaps other species. This begs the question of what expanded the circle, and the technologies of cosmopolitanism that I mentioned earlier are a plausible candidate, that, namely the consumption of history, literature, and realistic, realistic fiction and journalism. And a number of experiments have shown that if, you, if, if a person is encouraged to adopt, adopt the vantage point of some other person by reading or listening to their words, they become more sympathetic to that person, but also to the entire category of, of people that that individual represents. Some historical evidence include the fact that the humanitarian revolution of the 18th century was preceded by the so-called Republic of Letters, the widespread dissemination of ideas through print. The second half of the 20th century with the long peace and rights revolutions occurred in the electronic global village. And though it's too soon to know whether the color revolutions or Arab Spring will have a happy ending, uh, they have undoubtedly been fostered by the rise of the internet and social media. Finally, there's the escalator of reason, the possibility that the growth of literacy, education, and public discourse have encouraged people to think more abstractly and more universally. They rise above their parochial vantage point, which makes it harder to privilege their own interests over others. It encourages them to step back and recognize the futility of cycles of violence, and increasingly to see violence as a problem to be solved rather than as a contest to be won. Some historical evidence includes the little appreciated fact that abstract reasoning abilities, as measured by IQ scores, have increased throughout the 20th century, the so-called Flynn effect, uh, in which IQ has increased by three points a decade throughout the 20th century. Other studies have shown that people in societies with higher levels of education and measured intelligence, holding all else equal, commit fewer crimes, co cooperate more in experimental games, have more classically liberal attitudes, such as opposition to racism and xenophobia, and are more receptive to democracy. The final question uh, that I'll ask uh, is to wonder why so many of these forces seem to be pushing in the same direction, away from violence. And I think it's because violence is what game theorists call a social dilemma. Namely, it's tempting to an aggressor uh, to exploit the other through violence, but ruinous to the victim. And since in the long run, anyone can be either an aggressor or a, aggressor or a victim, all parties would be better off if everyone agreed to avoid violence. The human dilemma is how to get the other guy to refrain from violence at the same time as you do. Uh, if you are a uh, unconditional pacifist and unilaterally lay down your arms, you will be a sitting duck. One can well imagine that over the course of history, human experience and human ingenuity have gradually chipped away at this problem, just like we have tried to solve other, uh, eliminate other scourges of nature like pestilence and hunger. And all of the pacifying forces that I've mentioned serve to increase the material, emotional, or cognitive incentives of all parties to avoid violence. Well, regardless of the 
best explanation for the decline of violence, I think it has implications that are profound. For one thing, it calls for a reorientation of our efforts toward violence reduction from a moralistic mindset to an empirical mindset. That is, instead of lamenting why is there war, perhaps we should ask why is there peace? Instead of what are we doing wrong, perhaps we should ask what have we been doing right? Because we have been doing something right, and it seems to me that it sure would be good to know what exactly it is. Also, the decline of violence calls for a reassessment of modernity, of the erosion of family, tribe, tradition, and religion by the forces of individualism, cosmopolitanism, reason, and science. Now, everyone acknowledges the gifts of modernity, such as longer and healthier lives, less ignorance and superstition, and richer experiences. Again, it's Matt Ridley who has made this point uh, with far more evidence and eloquence than, uh, than I could. But there's always been a current of nostalgia and romanticism that has questioned the price. Uh, is it worth it if we have to live with the threat of terrorism, genocide, world wars, and nuclear weapons? However, if, despite impressions, the long-term trend, though halting and incomplete, is that violence of all kinds is decreasing, I believe that it calls for a rehabilitation of the uh, ideal of modernity and progress, and it's cause for gratitude for the institutions of civilization and enlightenment that have made it possible. Thank you very much.